The Pastors College began on a very small scale in the year 1856. Since that date, it is educated and sent forth into the ministry not less than 350 men, of whom after deductions by death and other causes, about 300 remain in the Baptist denomination, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In addition to this, a far larger number of men receive gratuitous education in the evening, training them to be city missionaries, suppliers of religious books, or useful private Christians. The institution receives no man in order to make him a preacher, but was established to help further the education of brethren who have been preaching, with some measure of success for two years at the least. Many men of earnest spirit and established Christian character are hindered in their efforts to do good by the meagerness of their knowledge. Conscious of their own defects, they endeavor to improve themselves. But in the absence of a guide, their need of books and their lack of time prevent their progress. These are the men whom the pastor's college welcomes. Men in whom piety, zeal, and the indwelling spirit are to be found need not fear refusal at our doors on account of poverty. If they possess those gifts of utterance, which are essential to the preacher, the college aims at training preachers rather than scholars, to develop the faculty of ready speech, to help them understand the word of God and to foster the spirit of consecration, courage, and confidence in God. These objects are so important that we put all other manners into a secondary position. If a student should learn a thousand things and yet fail to preach the gospel acceptably, his college course will have missed its true design. Surely the pursuit of literary prizes and the ambition for classical honors to occupy his mind is to divert his attention from his life work. They are perilous rather than beneficial. To be wise in winning souls is a wisdom ministers should possess. In the pastor's college, definite doctrines are held and taught. We hold by the doctrines of grace and the old orthodox faith and have no sympathy with the countless theological novelties of the present day, which are novelties only in outward form. In substance, they are repetitions of errors exploded long ago. Our standing in doctrinal manners is well known, and we make no profession of carte blanche charity. Yet we find no failure in the number of earnest spirits who rally to our standard, believing that in truth alone can true freedom be found. The support of the college is derived from the free will offerings of the Lord's people. We have no role of subscribers, although many friends send us aid at regular intervals. Our confidence is that God will supply all our needs, and he has always done so heretofore. The president of the college has never derived a farthing from the work for himself in any shape, but on the contrary delights to give to the work all that he can, both of money and free service. Therefore, he confidently appeals to others to assist him in maintaining the institution. No work can possibly bestow a greater benefit upon mankind than the training of ministers whom God has chosen, for around them spring up churches, schools, and all the agencies of religion and philanthropy. As we are commanded to pray for laborers and the Lord's harvest, so are we bound to prove the honesty of our prayers by our actions. In reply to many requests from those ministers who in their student days listen to my lectures, I submit a selection to the press. This, however, I cannot do without an apology, for these addresses were not originally prepared for the public eye, and are scarcely presentable for criticism. My college lectures are colloquial, familiar, full of anecdote, and often humorous. They are purposely made so to suit the occasion. At the end of the week, I meet the students and find them weary with sterner studies, and I judge it best to be as lively and interesting in my lectures as I can be. They have had their fill of classics, mathematics, and divinity, and are only in a condition to receive something which will attract and secure their attention 
and fire their hearts. Our tutor, Mr. Rogers, compares my Friday work to the sharpening of the pen, the fashioning of the head, the straightening, the laying on of the metal, and the polishing of Ben, done during the week. The press concludes with an effort to give point and sharpness. To succeed in this, the lecturer must not be dull himself nor demand any great effort from his audience. I am as much at home with my young brethren as in the bosom of my own family. Therefore I speak without restraint. Generous minds will take this into account in reading these lectures, and I shall hope that all who favor me with their criticisms will be of that noble order. Possibly cutting remarks may be made upon my frequent references to myself, my own methods of procedure, and my personal reminiscences. These also were intentional. I have purposely given an almost autobiographical tinge to the whole because of my own experience, such as it is, is the most original contribution I can offer my own students, which is as weighty as any other within my reach. It would have been impossible for me to quote the experiences of other men if they had not been bold enough to record them, and I make an honest attempt to acknowledge my debt to my greater predecessors by writing down my own experiences. Whether this arises from egotism or not, each reader shall decide according to the sweetness or acidity of his own disposition. A father is excused when he tells his sons his own life story and finds it the readiest way to enforce his maxim. The old soldier is forgiven when he shoulders his crutch and shows how fields were won. I beg that the license which tolerates these may, on this occasion, be extended to me. It would have saved me much labor had I reserved these lectures for re-delivery to new companies of freshmen, and I am conscious of no motive in printing them but that of desiring to keep my counsels alive in the memories of those who heard them years ago and impressing them upon others who dwell beyond the precincts of the classroom. The age has become intensely practical and needs a ministry, not only orthodox and spiritual, but also natural in utterance and practically shrewd. Officialism is sick unto death. Life is a true heir to success and is coming to its heritage. Mannerisms, pomposities and proprieties, once so potent in the religious world, are becoming as obsolete in the reverence of men as those gods of high Olympus, for whom in past ages poets tuned their lyres and sculptors quickened marble into beauty. Truth and life must conquer, and their victory is nearest when they cease to be encumbered with the grave clothes of conventionalism and pretense. It is delicious to put one's foot through the lath and plaster of old affectations in order to make room for the granite walls of reality. This has been a main design with me, and may God send success to the effort. The solemn work with which a Christian ministry concerns itself demands a man's all, and that all should be at its best. To engage in it half-heartedly is an insult to God and man. Slumber must forsake our eyelids sooner than men shall be allowed to perish. Yet we are all prone to sleep as do others, and students among the rest are apt to act a part of the foolish virgins. Therefore I have sought to speak out my whole soul in the hope that I might not create or foster dullness in others. May he in whose hands are the churches and their pastors bless these words to my younger brethren in the ministry, and if so I shall count it more than a full reward and shall gratefully praise the Lord. Should this publication succeed, I hope very soon to issue in similar form a work upon commentating, containing a full catalog of commentaries and a second set of lectures. I shall be obliged by any assistance rendered to the sale, for the price is not remunerable, and persons interested in our subjects are not numerous enough to secure a very large circulation. Hence it is only by the kind aid of all appreciating friends that I shall be able to publish the rest of the contemplated series. Lecture 1. The Minister Take heed unto yourself and to the doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, verse 16 Every workman knows the necessity of keeping his tools in a good state of repair. 
For if the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put forth more strength. If the workman loses the edge on his axe, he knows there will be a greater pull upon his energies, or his work will be badly done. Michelangelo, the best in the fine arts, understood so well the importance of his tools that he always made his own brushes with his own hands. And in this he gives us an illustration of the God of grace, who with special care fashions for himself all true ministers. Like Quentin Matsis, in the story of the Antwerp School, the Lord is able to work with the faultiest kind of instrumentality as he does when he occasionally makes very foolish preaching to be useful in conversion. He can even work without agents as he does when he saves men without a preacher at all, applying his word directly by his Holy Spirit. But we cannot regard God's absolute sovereign acts as a rule for our action. He may in his own sovereignty do as he pleases, but we must act as his clearer dispensations instruct us. One of the clear facts is that the Lord usually adapts means to ends, from which the plain lesson is that we are likely to accomplish most when we are in the best spiritual condition. In other words, we shall usually do our Lord's work best when our gifts and graces are in good order, and we shall do our worst when they are most out of order. This is a practical truth for our guidance when the Lord makes exceptions. They do but prove the rule. We are, in a certain sense, our own tools, and therefore must keep ourselves in order. If I want to preach the gospel, I can only use my own voice, and so I must train my vocal powers. I can only think with my own brains and feel with my own heart. Therefore, I must educate my intellectual and emotional faculties. I can only weep and agonize for souls in my own renewed nature. Therefore, I must watchfully maintain the tenderness which was in Christ Jesus. It will be in vain for me to stock my library or organize societies or project schemes if I neglect the culture of myself. For books and agencies and systems are only remotely the instruments of my holy calling. My own spirit, soul, and body are my nearest machinery for sacred service. My spiritual faculties and my inner life are my battle axe and weapons of war. Robert Murray McChain, writing to a ministerial friend who traveled with the goal of perfecting himself in the German tongue, used language identical with our own. I know you will apply hard to German, but do not forget the culture of the inner man. I mean of the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp. Every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember you are God's sword, his instrument. I trust a chosen vessel to him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfection of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses so much as likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. For the herald of the gospel to be spiritually out of order in his own proper person is, both to himself and to his work, a most serious calamity. And yet, my brethren, how easily is such an evil produced, and with what watchfulness must it be guarded against? Traveling one day by express from Perth to Edinburgh, we suddenly came to a dead stop because a very small screw in one of the engines, every railway locomotive consisting virtually of two engines, had been broken. When we started again, we were obliged to crawl along with one piston rod at work instead of two. Only one small screw was gone. If that screw had been right, the train would have rushed along its iron road. But the absence of that insignificant piece of iron disarranged the whole. Similarly, a train is said to have been stopped on one of the United States railways by flies in the grease box of the carriage wheels. The analogy is perfect. A man fitted to be useful in all other respects may, by some small defect, be exceedingly hindered or even rendered utterly useless. Such a result is all the more grievous because it is associated with the gospel, which is in the highest sense 
adapted to produce the grandest results. It is a terrible thing when the healing balm loses its efficacy through the blunderer who administers it. You all know the injurious effects frequently produced upon water flowing through lead pipes. Even so, the gospel itself, when flowing through men who are spiritually unhealthy, may be debased until it grows harmful to its hearers. We should fear the Calvinistic doctrine that becomes a most evil teaching when it is set forth by men of ungodly lives and exhibited as if it were a cloak for licentiousness. Arminianism, on the other hand, with its wide sweep of the offer of mercy, may do most serious damage to the souls of men if the careless tone of the preacher leads his hearers to believe they can repent whenever they please. And therefore, no urgency surrounds the gospel message. Moreover, when a preacher is poor in grace, any lasting good which may be the result of his ministry will usually be feeble and utterly out of proportion with what might have been expected. Much sowing will be followed by little reaping. Thus the interest upon the talents will be insignificantly small. In two or three of the battles which were lost in the American Civil War, the result is said to have been due to bad gunpowder, supplied by certain shoddy contractors to the army. Consequently, the due effect of a bombardment was not produced. So it may be with us. We may miss our mark, lose our end and aim, and waste our time by not possessing the true vital force within ourselves, or not possessing it in such a degree that God could consistently bless us. Beware of being shoddy preachers. It should be one of our first cares that we ourselves be saved men. That a teacher of the gospel should first be a partaker of it is a simple truth. But at the same time, it is a rule of the uttermost importance. We are not among those who accept the apostolic succession of young men simply because they assume it. If their college experience has been more vivacious and spiritual, and if their honors have been connected more with athletic exercises than with labors for Christ, then we demand evidence of another kind than what they are able to present to us. No amount of fees paid to learn doctors and no amount of classics received in return appear to us to be evidences of a call from above. True and genuine devotion to God is necessary as the first indispensable qualification. Whatever call a man may pretend to have, if he has not been called to holiness, he certainly has not been called to the ministry. First, be trimmed thyself, and then adorn thy brother, says the rabbi. The hand, says Gregory, that means to make another clean, must not itself be dirty. If your salt be unsavory, how can you season others? Conversion is essential in a minister. You who are candidates to our pulpits, you must be born again. The possession of this first qualification is not a thing to be taken for granted by any man, for there is a very great possibility of our being mistaken as to whether we are converted or not. Believe me, it is no child's play to make your calling an election sure. The world is full of counterfeits and swarms with panderers to carnal self-conceit, who gather around ministers as vultures around a carcass. Our own hearts are deceitful, so that truth lies not on the surface, but must be drawn up from the deepest well. We must search ourselves very anxiously and very thoroughly, lest by any means, after having preached to others, we ourselves should be cast away. How horrible to be a preacher of the gospel and yet to be unconverted. Let each man here whisper to his inmost soul what a dreadful thing it will be for me if I should be ignorant of the power of the truth, which I am preparing to proclaim. Unconverted ministry involves the most unnatural relationships. A graceless pastor is like a blind man elected to a profession of optics, philosophizing upon light and vision distinguish into others the nice shades and delicate blending of the prismatic colors, while he himself is in absolute darkness. He is a dumb man elevated to the chair of music, a deaf man fluent upon symphonies and harmonies, 
He is a mole professing to educate eaglets, a marine gastropod mollusk elected to preside over angels. To such a relationship one might apply the most absurd and grotesque metaphors, except that the subject is too solemn. It is a dreadful position for a man to stand in, for he has undertaken a work for which he is totally holy and altogether unqualified, but not from the responsibilities of which his unfitness will not screen him, but because he woefully invites them. Whatever his natural gifts, whatever his mental powers may be, he is utterly out of court for spiritual work if he has no spiritual life, and it is his duty to cease the ministerial office until he has received his first and simplest of qualifications for it. Unconverted ministry must be equally dreadful in another respect. If the man has no commission, what a very unhappy position for him to occupy. What can he see in the experience of his people to give him comfort? How must he feel when he hears the cries of penitence or listens to their anxious doubts and solemn fears? He must be astonished to think that his words should be held to that end. The word of an unconverted man may be blessed to lead to the conversion of souls, since the Lord, while he disowns a man, will still honor his own truth. How perplexed such a minister must be when he is consulted concerning the difficulties of mature Christians in a pathway of experience in which his own regenerate hearers are led, he must feel himself quite at a loss. How can he listen to their deathbed joys or join in their rapturous fellowships around the table of their Lord? In many instances of young men put to a trade which they cannot endure, they have run away to see sooner than follow an irksome business. But where shall that man flee who is apprenticed for life to this holy calling, and yet is a total stranger to the power of godliness? How can he daily bid men come to Christ while he himself is a stranger to his dying love? O oh, sirs, surely this must be perpetual slavery. Such a man must hate the sight of a pulpit as much as a galley slave hates the oar. And how useless such a man must be when he has to guide travelers along a road which he has never trodden, or to navigate a vessel along a coast of which he knows none of the landmarks. He is called to instruct others, being himself a fool. What can he be but a cloud without rain or a flower without blossoms? He's like a traveler in the wilderness, thirsty and ready to die beneath the broiling sun when suddenly it comes to the long-desired well and horror of horrors, finds it without a drop of water. So it is when souls thirsting after God come to a graceless ministry. They are ready to perish because the water of life is not to be found. Better to abolish pulpits and fill them with men who have no experiential knowledge of what they teach. Alas, the unregenerate pastor also becomes terribly mischievous for of all the causes which create infidelity, the godly ministers must be ranked among the first. I read the other day that no phase of evil presented so marvelous a power for destruction as the unconverted minister of a parish with an expensive organ, a choir of ungodly singers, and an aristocratic congregation. It was the opinion of the writer that there could be no greater instrument for damnation to hell than that. People go to their place of worship, sit down comfortably, and think they must be Christians, when all along their religion consists only in listening to an orator and having their ears tickled with music and perhaps their eyes amused with graceful action and fashionable manners. The entire affair is no better than what they hear and see at the opera. Not even so good, perhaps, in point of aesthetic beauty, and not an atom more spiritual. Thousands are congratulating themselves and even blessing God that they are devout worshippers, when at the same time they are living in an unregenerate, Christless state, having a form of godliness but denying the power of it. 
one who presides over a system which aims at nothing higher than formalism, is far more a servant of the devil than a minister of God. A formal preacher can be mischievous, even while he preserves his outward equilibrium. Without the preserving balance of godliness, sooner or later he is almost sure to fall in his moral character, and in what a position he will then be in. How God is blasphemed and the gospel abused. Terrible is it to consider what a death must await such a man, and what must be his after condition. The prophetic pictures of King of Babylon going down to hell with all the kings and princes whom he had destroyed, and whose capitals he had laid waste, rising up from their places in pandemonium, and saluting the fallen tyrant with a cutting sarcasm, Art thou become like unto us? Can you imagine a man who has been a minister, but who has lived without Christ in his heart, going down to hell amongst all the imprisoned spirits who used to listen to him, and amongst all the ungodly of his parish, rising up and saying to him in bitter tones, Art thou also become as we are? Physician, did you not heal yourself? Are you claimed to be a shining light cast down into the darkness forever? Oh, if one must be lost, let it not be in this fashion. To be lost under the shadow of a pulpit is dreadful, but how much more so to perish from the pulpit itself. There is an awful passage in John Bunyan's treatise entitled A Few Sighs from Hell, which often rings fully in my ears. Quote, how many souls have blind priests been the means of destroying by their ignorance, preaching that was no better for their souls than rat's poison to the body? Many of them, it is to be feared, have whole towns to answer for. Ah, friend, I tell thee, thou hast taken in hand to preach to the people. It may be thou hast taken in hand, thou canst not tell what. Will it not grieve thee to see thy whole parish come bellowing after thee into hell, crying out, This we have to thank thee for. Thou wast afraid to tell us of our sins, lest we should not put meat fast enough into thy mouth. O cursed wretch, who was not content, blind guide as thou was, to fall into the ditch thyself, but has also led us thither with thee. End quote. Richard Baxter, in his book, The Reformed Pastor, amid many other solemn manners, writes as follows, quote, Take heed to yourselves, lest you should be void of that saving grace of God which you offer to others, and be strangers to the effectual working of that gospel which you preach, unless while you proclaim the necessity of a Savior to the world, your heart should neglect him, and you should miss of an interest in him and his saving benefits. Take heed to yourselves, lest you perish while you call upon others to take heed of perishing, unless you famish yourselves while you prepare their food. Though there be a promise of shining as stars as those that turn many to righteousness, Daniel 12, verse 3, this is but on supposition that they be first turned to it themselves. Their own sincerity in the faith is the condition of their glory simply considered though their great ministerial labors may be a condition of the promise of their greater glory. Many men have warned others that they come not to that place of torment, which yet they hasted to themselves. Many a preacher is now in hell that has an hundred times called upon his ears to use the utmost care and diligence to escape it. Can any reasonable man imagine that God should save men for offering salvation to others? Well, they refused it themselves, and for telling others those truths which they themselves neglected and abused. Many a tailor goes in rags that makes costly clothes for others, and many a cook scarce licks his fingers when he has dressed for others the most costly dishes. Believe it, brethren, God never saved any man for being a preacher, nor because he was an able preacher but because he was a justified, sanctified man, and consequently faithful in his master's work. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves first, that you be that which you persuade others to be, and believe that which you persuade them daily to believe, 
and have heartily entertained that Christ and Spirit which you offer to others. He that bade you love your neighbors as yourselves did imply that you should love yourselves and not hate and destroy both yourselves and them. End quote. My brethren, let these weighty sentences have due effect upon you. Surely there can be no need to add more, but let me pray you to examine yourselves and so make good use of what has been addressed to you. Having settled this mantra of true religion, it is of the next importance to the minister that his piety or godliness be vigorous. He is not to be content with being equal to the rank and file of Christians in general. He must be a mature and advanced believer, for the ministry of Christ has been truly called the choicest of his choice, the elect of his election, a church picked out of the church. If he were called to an ordinary position, to common work, then common grace might perhaps satisfy him, though even then it would be an indolent satisfaction. But being elected to extraordinary labors and called to a place of unusual peril, he should be anxious to possess that superior strength which alone is adequate to his station. His pulse of vital godliness must beat strongly and regularly. His eye of faith must be bright. His foot of resolution must be firm. His hand of activity must be quick. His whole inner man must be in the highest degree of sanity. It is said of the Egyptians that they chose their priests from the most learned of their philosophers, and then they esteemed their priests so highly that they chose their kings from them. We require to have, for God's ministers, the pick of all the Christian host, such men indeed that if the nation lacked kings, they could do no better than elevate them to the throne. Our weakest-minded, most timid, most carnal, and most ill-balanced men are not suitable candidates for the pulpit. There are some works which we should never allot to the invalid or to the deformed. A man may not be qualified for climbing lofty buildings. His brain may be too weak, and such elevated work might place him in great danger. By all means, let the unqualified man keep to the ground and find useful occupation, where a steady brain is less important. There are brethren who have comparable spiritual deficiencies, yet they cannot be called to a service which is visible and prominent, because their heads are too weak. If they were permitted a little success, they would be intoxicated with vanity." a vice all too common among ministers, and, of all things, the least becoming in them, and a most certain to secure them a fall. Should the time come that we as a nation be called to defend our hearths and homes, we would not send out our young children with swords and guns to meet the foe. Neither should the church send out every confident novice or inexperienced zealot to plead for the faith. For the fear of the Lord must teach the young man wisdom, or he is barred from the pastorate. The grace of God must mature his spirit, or he had better tarry till power be given him from on high. The highest moral character must be zealously maintained. Many are disqualified for office in the church who are well enough as simple members. I hold very stern opinions with regard to Christian men who have fallen into gross sin. I rejoice that they may be truly converted and with mingled hope and caution received into the church. But I bravely question whether a man who has grossly sinned should be very readily restored to the pulpit. As John Angel James remarks, When a preacher of righteousness has stood in the way of sinners, he should never again open his lips in the great congregation until his repentance is as notorious as his sin. Let those who have been shorn by the sons of Ammon tarry at Jericho until their beards be grown. This has often been used as a taunt to beardless boys to whom it is evidently inapplicable. It is, however, an accurate enough metaphor for dishonored and characterless men, no matter what their age is. Alas, the beard of reputation once shorn is hard to grow again. In most cases, open immorality, however deep the repentance, is a fatal sign that ministerial graces were never in a man's character. Caesar's wife must be beyond suspicion, and there must be no ugly rumors as to ministerial inconsistency in the past, or the hope of usefulness will be slim. 
Into the church such fallen ones are to be received as penitents, and into the ministry they may be received, if God puts them there. My doubt is not about that, but rather, did God ever place them there in the first place? And my belief is that we should be very slow to put men back into the pulpit who, having been once tried, have proved themselves to have too little grace to stand the crucial test of ministerial life. For some work, we choose none but the strong, and when God does call us to ministerial labor, we should endeavor to get grace that we may be strengthened in the fitness for our position, and not be mere novices carried away by the temptations of Satan to the entry of the church and our own ruin. We are to stand equipped with the whole armor of God, ready for feats of valor, not expected of others. To us, self-denial, self-forgetfulness, patience, perseverance, and long-suffering must be everyday virtues. And who is sufficient for these things? We need to live very near to God if we would approve ourselves and our vocation. Remember, as ministers, your whole life, especially your whole pastoral life, will be affected by the vigor of your piety. If your zeal grows dull, you will not pray well in the pulpit. You will pray even worse in the family, and worst while in study alone. When your soul becomes lean, your hearers, without knowing how or why, will find that your prayers in public have little savor for them. They may perhaps feel your barrenness before you perceive it yourself. Your discourses will then betray your decline. You may utter well-chosen words and fitly ordered sentences before, but there will be a perceptible loss of spiritual force. You will shake yourselves as at other times, even as Samson did, but you will find that your great strength has departed in your daily communion with your people. They will not be slow to mark the all-pervading decline of your graces. Sharp eyes will see the gray hairs here and there long before you do. Let a man be afflicted with the disease of the heart, and all evils will be wrapped up in that one organ. His stomach, lungs, internal organs, muscles, and nerves will all suffer for it. Likewise, let a man have his heart weakened in spiritual things, and very soon his entire life will feel the withering influence. Moreover, as a result of your own decline, every one of your hearers will suffer more or less. The most vigorous amongst them will overcome the depressing tendency, but the weaker sort will be seriously damaged. It is the same with us and our hearers as it is with watches and the public clock. If our watch be wrong, very few besides ourselves will be misled by it. But if the Greenwich Observatory should go amiss, half of London would lose its reckoning. So it is with a minister. He is a parish clock. Many take their time from him, and if he be incorrect, they are all in danger of going off course, more or less. He is greatly accountable for all the sin which he causes. This we cannot endure to think of, my brethren. It will not bear a moment's comfortable consideration, yet it must be looked at if we would guard against it. You must remember, too, that we have need of very vigorous piety, because our danger is so much greater than that of others. Upon the whole, no position is so attacked with temptation as the ministry. Despite the popular idea that ours is a snug retreat from temptation, it is no less true that our dangers are more numerous and more insidious than those of ordinary Christians. Our position may be advantageous ground for height, but that height is perilous, and to many the ministry has proved a tarpian rock. If you ask what these temptations are, time might fell us to enumerate them, but among them are both the coarser and the more refined. The coarser are such temptations as self-indulgence at the table, enticements to which are superabundant among a hospitable people, or the temptations of the flesh which are incessant with young unmarried men, set on high by an admiring throng of young women, and so forth. Your own observation will soon reveal to you a thousand snares, unless indeed your eyes are blinded. There are more secret snares than these from which we can less easily escape. 
and of these the worst is the temptation to ministerialism, the tendency to read our Bibles as ministers, to pray as ministers, to get into doing the whole of our religion not as ourselves personally, but only relatively concerned in it. To lose the personality of repentance and faith is a loss indeed. No man, says John Owen, preaches his sermon well to others if he does not first preach it to his own heart. Brethren, it is eminently hard to hold to this. Our office, instead of helping our piety, as some assert, is through the evil of our natures turned into one of its most serious hindrances. At least I find it so. How we kick and struggle against officialism, and yet how easily it does beset us like a long garment which twists around the racer's feet and impedes his running. But where, dear brethren, of this and all the other seductions of your calling? And if you have done so until now, continue still to be on guard until life's latest hour. We have noted only one of the perils, but indeed they are legion. The great enemy of souls takes care to leave no stone unturned for the preacher's ruin. Richard Baxter again gives good advice, quote, Take heed to yourselves, because the tempter will make his first and sharpest onset upon you. If you will be the leaders against him, he will spare you no further than God restrains him. He bears you the greatest malice that are engaged to do him the greatest mischief. As the devil hates Christ more than any of us, because Christ is the general of the field, and the captain of our salvation, and does more than all the world besides against the kingdom of darkness, so does he note the leaders under him more than the common soldiers on the like account in their proportion. He knows what a rout he may make among the rest if the leaders fall before their eyes. He has long tried that way of fighting, neither with small nor great comparatively, but these, and of smiting the shepherds, that he may scatter the flock. And so great has been his success this way that he will follow it on as far as he is able. Take heed, therefore, brethren, for the enemy has a special eye upon you. You shall have his most subtle insinuations and incessant solicitations and violent assaults. As wise and as learned as you are, take heed to yourselves. The devil is a greater scholar than you, and a nimbler disputant. He can transform himself into an angel of light to deceive you. He will get within you and trip up your heels before you are aware. He will play the juggler with you undiscerned, and cheat you of your faith or innocency, and you shall not know that you have lost it, nay, he will make you believe it is multiplied or increased when it is lost. You shall see neither hook nor line, much less a subtle angler himself, while he is offering you his bait, and his bait shall be so fitted to your temper and disposition that he will be sure to find advantages within you and make your own principles and inclinations to betray you. And whenever he ruins you, he will make you the instrument of others' ruin. What a conquest will he think he has got if he can make a minister lazy and unfaithful, if he can tempt a minister into covetousness or scandal. He will glory against the church and say, These are your holy preachers. You see what their preciseness is? and where it will bring them. He will glory against Jesus Christ himself and say, These are your champions. I can make your chiefest servants to abuse you. I can make the stewards of your house unfaithful. If he did so insult against God upon a false surmise, and tell him he could make Job to curse him to his face, Job one eleven, what would he do if he should proceed to prevail against us? And at last he will insult as much over you that ever he could draw you to be false to your great trust and to blemish your holy profession and to do him so much service that was your enemy. Oh, do not so far gratify Satan. Do not make him so much sport. Allow him not to use you as the Philistines did Samson, first to deprive you of your strength and then to put out your eyes and so to make you the manner of his triumph derision, end quote. Once more, we must cultivate the highest degree of godliness because our work imperatively requires it. The labor of the Christian ministry is well performed in exact proportion to the vigor of our renewed nature. 
Our work is only well done when it is well with ourselves. As is a workman, such will be the work. To face the enemies of truth, to defend the bulwarks of the faith, to rule well in the house of God, to comfort all who mourn, to edify the saints, to guide the perplexed, to bear with the errant, to win in their souls, all these and a thousand other works besides are not for a feeble mind, or a ready to halt, but are reserved for a great heart whom the Lord has made strong for himself. Seek then strength from the strong one, wisdom from the wise one, in fact all from the God of all. Thirdly, let the minister take care that his personal character agrees in all respects with this ministry. We have all heard the story of the man who preached so well and lived so badly that when he was in the pulpit, everybody said he ought never to come out again. And when he was out of it, they all declared he never ought to enter in it again. From the imitation of such a Janeth, may the Lord deliver us. May we never be priests of God at the altar and sons of Belial outside the tabernacle door. But on the contrary, May we be as Gregory Nazenzian says of Basil, thunder in our doctrine and lighten in our conversation. We do not trust those who have two faces, nor will men believe in those whose verbal and practical testimonies are contradictory. His actions, according to the Proverbs, speak louder than words. So an ill-mannered life will effectually drown the voice of the most eloquent ministry. After all, our truest building must be performed with our hands. Our character must be more persuasive than our speech. Here I would warn you not only of sins of commission, but also of sins of omission. Too many preachers forget to serve God when they are out of the pulpit. Their lives are negatively inconsistent. A poor dear brethren, the thought of being clockwork ministers who are not alive by the abiding grace within but are wound up by temporary influences. Men who are only ministers for the time being, under the stress of the hour of ministering, but cease to be ministers when they descend the pulpit stairs. True ministers are always ministers. Too many preachers are like those sand toys we buy for our children. You turn the box upside down and a little acrobat revolves and revolves until the sand is all run down. And then he hangs motionless. Likewise, there are some who persevere in the ministrations of truth as long as there is an official necessity for their work. But after that, no pay, no platform, no salary, no sermon. It is a horrible thing to be an inconsistent minister. Our Lord is said to have been like Moses for the reason that he was a prophet mighty in deed and word. The man of God should imitate his master, and that he should be mighty both in the word of his doctrine and in the deed of his example, and mightiest, if possible, in the latter. It is remarkable that the only church history we have is the Acts of the Apostles. The Holy Spirit has not preserved their sermons. They were very good ones, better than we shall ever preach. But still, the Holy Spirit has only taken care of their Acts. We have no books of the resolutions of the apostles. When we hold our church meetings, we record our minutes and resolutions. But the Holy Spirit only puts down the acts. Our actions should be such as to bear recording, for recorded they will be. We must live as under the more immediate eye of God, and as in the blaze of the great all-revealing day. Holiness in a minister is at once his chief necessity and his goodliest ornament. Mere moral excellence is not enough. There must be the higher virtue. A consistent character there must be, but it must be anointed with the sacred consecrating oil, or that which makes us most fragrant to God and man will be deficient. Old John Stoughton, in his treatise entitled The Preacher's Dignity and Duty, insists upon the minister's holiness in sentences full of weight. If Uzzah must die but for touching the ark of God, and that to stay it when it was about to fall, if the men of Beth Shemesh 
for looking into it. If the very beasts that do but come near the holy mount be threatened, then what manner of persons ought they to be who shall be admitted to talk with God familiarly, to stand before him as the angels do, and behold his face continually, to bear the ark upon their shoulders, to bear his name before the Gentiles, in a word, to be his ambassadors. Holiness becomes your house, O Lord, and were it not a ridiculous thing to imagine that the vessels must be holy, the garments must be holy, all must be holy, but only he upon whose very garments must be written holiness to the Lord might be unholy, that the bells of the horses should have an inscription of holiness upon them in Zechariah, and the saints' bells, the bells of Aaron, should be unholy. No, they must be burning and shining lights, or else their influence will dart some malignant quality. They must chew the cud and divide the hoof, or else they are unclean. They must divide the word right and walk uprightly in their life, and so join life to learning. If holiness be lacking, the ambassadors dishonor the country from whence they come, and the prince from whom they come, and this dead Amasa, this dead doctrine not quickened with a good life, lying in the way, stops the people of the Lord, and they cannot go on cheerfully in their spiritual warfare. The life of the preacher should be a magnet to draw men to Christ, and it is sad indeed when it keeps them from him. Sanctity in ministers is a loud call to sinners to repent, and when allied with holy cheerfulness, it becomes wondrously attractive. Jeremy Taylor, in his own rich language, tells us, Harris doves could never have invited so many strangers to their dovecotes if they had not been besmeared with opabalsamum. But, said Didymus, make your pigeons smell sweet and they will allure whole flocks. And if your life be excellent, if your virtues be like a precious ointment, you will soon invite your charges to run in odorum or guantorum, after your precious odors. But you must be excellent, not tanquam units de populo de tanquam homo dei. You must be a man of God, not after the common manners of men, but after God's own heart. And men will strive to be like you if you be like to God. But when you only stand at the door of virtue for nothing but to keep sin out, you will draw into the folds of Christ none but such as fear drives in. Another equally admirable Episcopal pastor has well and pithily said, The star which led the wise men to Christ and the pillar of fire which led the children to Canaan did not only shine but went before them. Matthew 2 verse 9, Exodus 13 verse 21. The voice of Jacob will do little good if the hands be the hands of Esau. In the law, no person who had any blemish was to offer holy gifts to the Lord. Leviticus 21, verses 17 and 20. The Lord by this taught us what graces ought to be in his ministers. The priest was to have in his robes bells and pomegranates. The one a figure of sound doctrine, the other of a fruitful life. Exodus 28, verses 33 and 34. The Lord will be sanctified in all those who draw near to him. Isaiah 52, verse 11. For the sins of the priests make the people abhor the offering of the Lord, 1 Samuel 2, verse 17. Even in little things, a minister must take care that his life is consistent with his ministry. He should be especially careful never to fall short of his word. This should be pushed even to scrupulousness. We cannot be too careful. Truth must not only be in us, but also shine from us. A celebrated doctor of divinity in London, who is now in heaven, I have no doubt, a very excellent and godly man, gave notice one Sunday that he intended to visit all his people. In order to be able to get around and visit them and their families once a year, he would visit all the seat holders in order. A person well known to me, who was then a poor man, was delighted with the idea that the minister was coming to his house to see him. About a week or two before he perceived it would be his turn, his wife was very careful to sweep the hearth and keep the house tidy. The man ran home early from work, hoping each night to find a doctor there. This went on for a considerable time. 
The minister either forgot his promise or grew weary in performing it, or for some other reason he never went to this poor man's house. The result was that this man lost confidence in all preachers, saying, They care for the rich, but they do not care for us who are poor. That man never settled down to any one place of worship for many years until at last he dropped into Exeter Hall and remained my hearer for years until Providence removed him. It was no small task to make him believe that any minister could be an honest man and could impartially love both rich and poor. Let us avoid doing such mischief by being very particular as to our words. We must remember that we are very much looked at Men hardly have the audacity to break the law in the open sight of their fellows. Yet in such publicity we live and move. We are watched by a thousand eagle eyes. Let us so act that we shall never need to care if all heaven and earth and hell swell the list of our spectators. Our public position is a great gain if we are enabled to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. Take heed, brethren, that you throw not away the advantage. When we say to you, my dear brethren, take care of your life, we mean be careful of even the minutia of your character. Avoid little debts, unpunctuality, gossip, nicknaming, petty quarrels, and all those little vices which fill the ointment with flies. The self-indulgences which have lowered the reputation of many must not be tolerated by us. The familiarities which have laid others under suspicion we must chastely avoid. The roughness which has rendered some obnoxious and the foolishness which has made others contemptible, we must put away. We cannot afford to run great risks through little things. Our care must be to act on this rule, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. It is not intended that we hold ourselves bound by every whim or fashion of the society in which we move. As a general rule, I hate the fashions of society and detest conventionalities. If I conceive it best to put my foot through a law of etiquette, I should feel gratified in having done so. We are men, not slaves, and are not to relinquish our manly freedom to be pawns of those who affect decorum or boast refinement. Yet, brethren, anything that verges upon the coarseness which is akin to sin we must shun as we would a viper. The rules of etiquette may be ridiculous to us, but not the example of Christ, and he was never coarse, low, discourteous, or indelicate. Even in your recreations, remember that you are ministers. When you are not on display, you are still officers in the army of Christ, and as such, humble yourselves. But if the lesser things must be looked after, how careful should you be in the great manners of morality, honesty, and integrity? Here the minister must not fail. His private life must ever keep good tune with his ministry. And if not, his day will soon set with him. And the sooner he retires, the better. For his continuance in his office will only dishonor the cause of God and ruin himself.